having read the book, I had the privilege of, of reading the book, and you can all pick up a copy on, on your way out. I picked up a few areas that I thought were really interesting. You mentioned one of them, uh, the role of citizens. Um, I also picked up free trade, taxes, and um, how to improve democracy. So, shall we start with the role of citizens? I think you both here, and you, you too, Paul, in your, in your writings on the role of citizens. Uh, how do you bolster the role of citizens? What, what would that involve? Well, I want Paul to answer this question, and then I'll get, give my ideas, because he's got lots, and I have a few ideas. OK, so first of all, I fundamentally agree with this importance that people are first and foremost their citizens. And uh, citizenship has implications both for, uh, for both aspects of this uh, uh, difficult marriage, as you describe, between the, the, the politics and the economics. Um, and, um, and the political aspect is that everybody has to have an equality of status, an equality of dignity, is how you put it in the book. And I think that's a very good way of phrasing it, an equality of dignity. Um, uh, and that, 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 that equality of dignity includes um, lots of different features, but in, in the political sphere, it includes uh, an, an equality of of, of, uh, of, of voice um, uh, and, and the quality of, of, of power of voting. Um, now, it's quite clear that um, in America, uh, we, America falls down on that one. Um, uh, it's, we've not got equal votes. It's not one person, one vote. It's one dollar, one vote, as you say. Um, in, in, so America has transformed itself into a plutocracy. That seems to me absolutely unambiguous. That's the fundamental problem with the politics of America. It's a plutocracy. Um, when we turn to the economic aspect of equality, um, then it's, it's also, I think, very clear. It, everybody has got to be willing and capable of contributing to the whole. Uh, willing and capable. Um, and spectacularly, in America, we don't have that either. Um, the rich won't pay taxes uh, to, to, to contribute, so they pay lower taxes than any other <laughs> income category in the society, which is absurd. Um, and uh, they won't pay people, that's their workers, well enough to put them in a position where, the, where they're capable of contributing to the whole. Um, so America falls down on both, and it's desperate. And like you, I'm a pessimist. I don't see how you get out of that. I just want to say that in Britain, Britain also falls down on both these things. It's a disastrous failure on both of them. But it's not because it's become a plutocracy. It's a very different diagnosis in Britain. So we'll turn to that later. But America, a plutocracy where I, like you, am in despair. Martin, you also write a lot about patriotism. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether, and this may be a bit controversial, but does a, a multicultural society, does it make the role of citizens more difficult? Is that why you argue for controlled immigration, that it's going to it takes time to integrate, to assimilate? Or I may have put too many... Yeah, that, I think that's, uh, that's not where I expected to go, but it's a very interesting question. Yasha Monk uh, has recently written a very interesting book on this, and, uh, and uh, I've reviewed it and I refer to it in my book. Um, so, one, this is obviously a very controversial issue, that goes without saying. Um, but my response goes something like this. Um, it's, I think I'm absolutely convinced it is possible to create a sufficient sense of belonging 
uh, economically, politically and socially within a diverse community. Um, because the values that are core to this, which I've been describing, seem to me ones that most people, the great majority of people share, and the people who came here share them, because that's why they want to be here. I also think two other things. Uh, the first is that citizenship is a privilege. It's not universally available. It's defined as a privilege. That's what it means. And therefore, the society as a whole, any society, has a right to decide who can come and be a citizen. And that's a completely standard part of any system. I happen to argue rather strongly that we don't want to have what the Athenians had and the Swiss have now, a metic society, namely society with permanent disenfranchised sit immigrants. We want them to be part of our civic community if they come. I think we're absolutely right on that. So it's, I believe, in civic nationalism and therefore Ralph Dar Darendorf was very strong and influenced me greatly on that. So, uh, but it is obvious that no country, certainly no developed country, can possibly say anybody can come in the world because, as I argue at length in one section, that would probably lead to billions. So the... We do need controls. They're very difficult to decide and implement. But if you have some controls around which there is consensus and they're operational, then when people come, they become part of our society and time can become part of our citizens. Their children should be educated along with everybody else's children uh, to share certain fundamental values. And the fundamental values are those that I described, that they are citizens, they have the rights and obligations of citizens, and that they believe in the values of the society thus defined of which they become part. It seems to me looking on this in Britain, particularly actually at this government, um, quite remarkably successful. Um, not completely successful, and I know this is a very controversial view, um, and I know they produce a report on racism which was incredibly controversial, but nonetheless the, the fact remains that people who are immigrants from different backgrounds, and I'm one, uh, have managed to fit in rather well into this society, and I believe that's a tremendous asset, and it has to be built around the idea that we all belong, we share values, we share obligations and we share rights. Um, so I'm not pessimistic, but of course that includes um, having controls that people believe in. And it's absolutely clear, and I wrote about in them in the referendum campaign, that the sense that we'd lost that control did violate many people's sense of what a legitimate their legitimate state should do. And, uh, and I understood that. It always seemed to me the best reason for voting for Brexit was that. Um, so this is a very difficult issue, but I think it is soluble. Uh, and I think actually Britain is one of the relatively successful countries. Everybody has difficulties with it. Certainly if I compare it with Italy, which I know quite well, or even France, I think it, we've done a little better. In terms of, I mean, the, the book is also a sort of manifesto for reforming democracy and reforming capitalism. But to stay on the democracy point, there are a lot of intriguing suggestions, um, including d direct political dona donations by corporations and foreigners should be banned. I, I agree with you, and I wish it would happen, but I don't, don't think that's going to happen. But you write about a house of merit. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I was thinking, it, one of the beautiful things of the British Constitution is since we don't have one, we can change our arrangement any way we like. And I think one of the problems the Americans have, I'm a little less negative than Paul, but the, uh, the Americans have is their constitution has become unreformable. So they've got legacies of the 18th century. I cannot believe that any of the founding fathers believed, for example, when they said that in order to have a militia, people should be allowed idle to bear arms. They meant that every certifiable lunatic should carry a machine gun uh, <laughs> because they weren't bombed. Well, that's sort of unreformable. Now, we, we are thinking about reform here. Uh, and I actually believe, I had this argument with Rachel Reeves yesterday, but I remain of this view, that having a second chamber which is appointed is rather a good idea because 
it doesn't initiate legislation, it can't ultimately halt it. Uh, it, that should be initiated by the elected house and the government should be accountable to the elective house. That's clear to me. I can't see the point of having two different elected houses. They're just going to conflict with other. But having an appointive house as a, as a debating chamber and a revising chamber full of genuine experts who would never otherwise be there, which means getting rid of about two thirds of the people now, <laughs> changing the way, changing, not of course my wife, changing the uh, changing the basis on which they're selected. In other words, doing the reform that Blair so notoriously flunked would have been a good idea. I also have the more radical idea of having a House of the People selected by lot. Um, now I've been select. now this, nobody's going to take this up, but I will just give you an ex argument. So I have this wonderful friend, Nicholas Gruen, who's an absolutely brilliant economist, nobody, he's the most brilliant economist you've never heard of. He lives in, Aus he's an Australian consul economic consultant. And he has become very keen on the, the choice of people by lot. Uh, now I thought about this and I thought, well, you might remember that de Tocqueville, who was a serious expert on this, said that the most important institution in American life is the jury. Mm. And the reason was uh, yes. the, that the reason was that this called on everyone to take a responsible role in society. I've been good lucky enough to be on a jury twice, and I've been profoundly impressed by the way people approach this job. And really. So here is a, an idea, the, 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 the first stage to what I suppose is to have citizens' juries to look at, would be temporary, really controversial issues. And the best example I've come across, but it's a wonderful example, which I described Phil, and I won't go f further in this, is the Irish citizen jury, which was created to review the issue of, of abortion which as you can imagine, in Ireland, was seriously controversial. And they needed to find some way of getting a consensus and not end up in the mess they were in, or in the mess that the states are now in. And so they created a citizen jury, for, which served for quite a long time, I think six months or so, I don't know. They had experts and debates, and at the end of this, there were about 100 people involved, Philip would probably remember the exact numbers, might be more, they reached a consensus. And that consensus was in favour of, uh, well, turned out, once they had reached this, to be the social the same, consensus. Same idea as constituent assembly. Sorry? It's the same general idea as constituent assemblies. Yes. Not the, the, well, on a particular issue. Yeah. I think now that that's what we should have done before we started the Brexit campaign. Uh, it would have been very interesting to, to try and see where people came out and what we should do. So I've got more radical ideas, but I think we should, we in Britain have the privilege that we can actually, actually let me, change let me, let things. Me, let me so me why not do one. so while everybody else is stuck? Let me mention one. Uh, there's a suggestion that adults should have more votes the younger they are be because um, children and the unborn cannot vote while old people can. I'm totally with you on Well, that. I have two ideas. One, an idea I put forth many years ago, I'm sure I'm the only one, that mothers, obviously mothers, should have a vote for, for their for minor them. children, and obviously not fathers. You all know the literature on the different behaviour of mother, women and men towards their children. I Last it is true, there's, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, but the other idea I have is that everybody says the problem with voting is that it's very short term. And well, I think that's true. So why not give more votes to people the younger they are? Uh, so uh, you start with people in the, we can we must think a bit more imaginatively about our system. So I think I should have one vote, and my sons should have maybe three or four votes, and maybe that their that my grandson, when he's got the vote in three years' time, he can get ten votes. But anyway, Let me I think hear what Paul thinks I have about many other Paul such ideas. Paul, Paul. right? <laughs> you read the book. We're, 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 we're going to disagree, Martin, um, um, on a number of things. First, I think God. it's very important to hang on to the principle of one person, one vote, and the problem in Britain is in practice. We don't even have that. There are huge groups of people who are effectively disenfranchised from mm. political influence. 
Um, and uh, I, it's, um, uh, we know it's a very distinctive thing. It's very, very straightforward who's been disenfranchised from political influence. Um, and I, I will also take issue, whilst I'm at it, with this business about um, uh, a problem that people are short-termist. I fundamentally disagree with that diagnosis. People have children and grandchildren. You dedicated your book to your grandchildren. Ch people, ordinary people, naturally think about the future the, in terms of generation or two. They worry about what are their children going to do when they grow up. It's governments that can't think beyond the next election. The myth that ordinary people are short-termist and wise governments, if only we left it to them, would think long-term, is a travesty of the truth. It's governments that can't think past the end of their bloody nose. Huh? Let, let's move on. So, that's uh, one thing, right? Me, so, we've oh, got no... OK, OK, go ahead. Go I'm ahead, not, go I'm ahead. not done with him. <laughs> I, I'm not done with him, right? <laughs> who in Britain are the people who are left behind? And it's very distinctive and it's tragic. Huh? And it's, 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 it's the... We, we have got the worst social mobility in Europe, life chances. The chances that if you are born in a household that's in the bottom half of the population in income terms, what's your chance that your children will grow up into and end up in the top half? Right? That's intergenerational social mobility. Right? Why does it matter? Because that's the principle of whether you've got despairing hopelessness or not. Right? And Britain is the peak in the whole of the OECD for despairing hopelessness. Right? If your parents are, are living in the wrong place, so you're growing up in the wrong place, which means anywhere outside commuting distance of London. Right? So if you're not in commuting distance of London, sorry, you're born in the wrong place. And if you, um, your parents didn't go to university, um, then, sorry, uh, you just got the wrong parents. Actually, it's got more complicated than that. It's now which university? <laughs> sorry to tell you, but there's actually only four that count now, right? It's, it's moved on from go to university. But anyway, um, that is a unique phenomenon in Britain. We've got the lowest intergenerational mo social mobility in the whole of the OECD, and it's those two factors both of which are eminently avoidable. Why is there such passion and anger in my voice? Because like you, I've got a backstory. Right? I grew up in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, now the poorest region in England, and both my parents left school when they were 12. So I ticked both boxes. Right? In my day, it was just possible to get from where I started to where I finished, right? though you had to be damn lucky. Right? I'm a fluke, right? Um, but it was possible. Nowadays, it's absolutely hopeless. If you're born with anything like my characteristics, your children are doomed. And that is a phenomenal disgrace. So that's why there's the passion and anger uh, in my voice, just as there is in yours. This is something that really ought to be fixed. And until we fixed it, um, nothing else will work. And so, yes, we should uh, have uh, a, a second chamber that is representative of people, but the vital thing is representative of left-behind places and left-behind people. Uh, let me just go to the audience, and also our uh, online audience is invited to send questions, and I can take a few questions. Please go ahead. Uh, Itan Shah from the British Academy. Uh, Thank you, Hitan Shah from the British Academy. Ma Martin, I remember reading your book, Why Globalization Works, about 20 years ago, but you didn't talk about globalization today. I'm really interested in, ha have, your, have your views changed? Uh, how far has globalization kind of impacted on this whole agenda? I mean, Danny Roderick, I think back in 2010, 11, said you can only have two of the three of globalization, democratic, uh, democracy, uh, and national sovereignty. Is that, uh, has that sort of thinking influenced what your views are? 
um, I have quite a lot in the book about this, on what I have, where I have the same view as before and where I have changed my mind. Um, and that will take quite a long time to discuss. Very broadly, I think the evidence is, uh, which is comfortable for me, is that trade has been less harmful than many people think. Uh, and I think the evidence for that is pretty strong. Uh, uh, I'm much less enthused about the freedom of capital flows, which in the, on that I have on my side uh, a very great economist, Morris Opsfeld, who was former chief economist of the IMF, who's written some very good papers on that. So if somebody came up with proposals to reduce capital mobility, and I have some ideas there, though I don't discuss them back to length, I would go along with that. That was not part of my globalization book. And I would point out, this is important, my, my globalization book had a, what I regard as a very important chapter, which was a reply to John Gray, in which John Gray had the thesis, which many people have, that globalization meant the end of the welfare state. And I pointed then at length to what was going on in the most open economies, rich economies in the world, which are of course the Scandinavian countries. They are spectacularly open and they have very well developed welfare states and incredibly high tax ratios. So this seems to me, and I pointed this out in detail, that that argument was senseless. So I argued in globalization there was a perfectly good reason to have a welfare state. It was perfectly feasible provided you preserve its legitimacy. Um, and I remain very strongly of that view. The Roderick trilemma just seems to me, well, go to I'm very fond of Danny, he's a great man, but he's wrong. Uh, and the, well, first of all, I think the entire, I won't go into the logic of the trilemma, but the basic point, he's trying to make people have a corner solution. I, you have, but there's absolutely no reason, and indeed it's perfectly obvious that any sensible country would want some of all three. Democracy isn't absolute, um, it's not even absolute domestically, for all the reasons I've outlined, um, nor is national sovereignty, and there are very obvious reasons why it is. Most countries understand, actually basically every country in the world except the US, uh, understands that they cannot live without international exchange. Um, any serious British politician who came along and said, actually we want to stop trade. Um, uh, well, then, if you want to close down the economy completely, that's a good idea. Uh, the, the, and as soon as you have trade, I made this point as it another sovereign is involved, automatically, and often many. And so you don't have the sovereignty to tell them what to do, unless you want to start a war over every good. That's why you have international trade arrangements of which the EU was one. The idea you can get rid of that and do whatever you like is absurd because they get a vote too. So obviously the sensible thing to do is to have to do at home what you have to do, maintain the community, citizenship and so forth, maintain the economy, reach international agreements that you think are useful for you and stick by them even though it constrains your sovereignty, because it constrains the sovereignty of everybody else at the same time, and you want that. So the sensible solution to have is a good mixture, blend, which can change over time of all three. And that, so I don't understand why I have to choose. And no other country in the world, even China, actually thinks you can do without any of these, some part of all of this. They accept they have to trade, they want to break the rules, of course they do, but they know they can't break all of them. And uh, actually, so do the Americans. So in the end, I think it's an empty argument. Yeah. I agree with very much on this. Um, you see, we agree um, on one thing. Yeah, let me, let me try and summarize it in a nutshell. What's the tragedy of, uh, this is where ordinary people do get things wrong um, and the political parties get things wrong. You need state plus nation um, and at the moment, the, 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 the right wants nation without state. The left wants state without nation. Uh, and the libertarians, bless them. Want uh, neither. Want neither, that's right. So we've got one faction for state, one faction for nation, and one faction for neither. And we need a faction which says we need both. And it, 
That is the weak voice uh, in politics. That's the weak voice. We, uh, I'd like to take two questions at the same time. Yeah, go ahead, sir, and then. <coughs> oh, great. Um, um, hello, David Goodhart. Uh, for this audience, nephew of Charles. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear that, David. I apologize. Yeah, I, I said, for this audience, my kind of title is nephew of Charles, the man oh. sitting to my left. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, Isn't that what you're known for? Martin, um, <laughs> well, well, I hope not, but uh, um, Ma you sound, Martin, as if you're an advocate of what I would call the kind of the missing, the missing middle in British politics and indeed in rich country politics generally. The, um, not, so I don't mean the middle of kind of Tony Blair, David Cameron, George Osborne. Um, I mean the middle of a little bit to the left economically, a little bit to the right social and culturally. So, you know, your form of, of Keynesian social democratic capitalism combined with some of your ideas about restricting immigration, respecting national sovereignty, for many people change is loss. You know, small c conservatism, which is completely compatible with very, very liberal views about lots of things. I mean, 3% of British people think you have to be white to be, to be British. Um, now, what, it's an extraordinary thing about modern politics, both in Britain and in other rich countries, that that missing middle is not represented in any of the major parties of centre-left or centre-right. Uh, the 2019 Tory, Tory election victory may have given a sort of po possibility of, of that kind of politics, and then we had COVID, and we have Boris's shenanigans, and it's sort of out of the window now. Why do you think that is, that that you know, that that prize, is it, that missing middle that is not, you know, it's, it, 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 that missing middle is not represented in, in our politics. Okay, thank uh, you, yeah. David. If you could give uh, the mic, yeah. Paul, Paul Tucker, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, two questions, Martin. Would you t have civics taught in British schools in the way that it used to be taught in the States? And secondly, could you say something about liberal constraints on commercial power, given that at Chicago School Antitrust, has in, in some senses enabled, if not promoted, concentrations of great wealth, so long as it holds out the prospect, often truly, of lower consumer um, prices. And the kind of broad question, um, to chapeau it if you like, is we seem to have more a uh, better articulated view of liberal constraints on majoritarian democracy than we do of liber liberal constraints on commercial society. And you've barely mentioned, either of you, liberal constraints, which is the thing that somehow has to sit between um, democracy and, and capitalism. Okay, well, it could take us hours to address these <laughs> questions, but I'm going I'm to challenge six you minutes. to do it in three minutes each. So David has asked a, a very powerful question, uh, and though I've got a chapter on politics, I am not an expert. Um, I think a lot of it is to do with uh, two-party systems which fragment the middle uh, between parties wh whose majorities are not them and that is why I've become um, not a proportional representation person but uh, um, I mean, if you really, fra I mean, I know all the arguments against it, but the Dutch have got it very nicely because they have two really strong middle parties. The Liberal Party and the Socialist Party are basically in the middle, and they're always central to one or other con con uh, coalition. Uh, the uh, anyway, that's. The, but the the answer is, I do actually think that the position I've advanced which I describe as a perfectly comfortable one for a social market, believer in the social market, social democracy, or just a left-wing conservative, leftish conservative, um, I think that uh, the problem we have is they can't coalesce. They don't seem to be able to coalesce. Mm -hmm. Could that change? I don't know, but it's, things are structured at the moment. It seems very, very uh, difficult. On... Um, Paul's question, I'll come to the last one. Um, I have a long discussion, really long discussion on competition issues and, uh, uh, and go through the history, the history of the Chicago School, 
uh, influence of Boas, isn't, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is uh, um, it was a disaster, and I go back to Teddy Roosevelt's, the, the invention of the, of the competition policy. I would remind you, this is often not known, that one of the most distinctive features of the social market view in Germany and of the Ordo school that backs it and the way in which they differed from the Austrians was their belief, uh, which I do think I mentioned, anyway, I read lots of, of this, um, that um, competition policy is central because the natural tendency, they actually believe with Marx, that the natural tendency of capitalism, if left to itself, is towards monopoly. I, and I go some significant way towards that, though not all the way. Now, what was the set first of your question? Yes, the answer is, I think we should try. Write that in the poll, please. Uh, it's, in the it's, in, it's, it's in the book. In the book. It's in the book. I can't write it. The book is, yeah, anyway. But yes, I think we, I even th have thought, the message this I've even thought the uh, that I put <laughs> forward the proposition, since I do think part of what motivated, made democratic capitalism so vibrant in the middle of the 20th century, I hate to say, was war. Uh, I mean, I've discussed that on passant, but the history of war, conscription. Anyway, I do think that to get over part of Paul's problem, the fact that the different classes of our society simply don't know one another, that maybe we have to think about some form of national service. Very controversial, not a view I would have held at all 20 years ago, rather illiberal, but how else do we start giving people who go to completely different schools in order to some sense they're part of one thing? And some sense well, that they're contributing to the whole. Yeah. Um, I think we've had, you know, we've had 40 years of uh, a radical experiment um, with uh, freeing markets um, and privatizing things and letting private companies find solutions to problems. It, I don't think it's worked. Um, and we, we, there's no permanent solutions to anything, right? I don't, there's no utopias. We're not looking for utopia. We're looking for something that might work an arrow of direction for the next 10 or 20 years. So um, on the political question, Martin's got a great analysis of voting shares. And the vital thing is to prevent the white working class, which is patriotic and socially conservative, if that group allies with the goggle-eyed nutters of the far right, that's a disaster because they're all wasted votes. The goggle-eyed nutters on the far right, let them waste their votes. So split that. That is the vital thing. We need a, a coalition in which the white working class votes as part of the winning coalition. That is vital. And that's, I think, what the Labour Party used to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's I, why it was important. And, and the loss of these people by the Democrats and the Labour Party is a real political problem because they won't get any better served by where they are now and they will get increasingly unhappy as a result. And I think that risks creating a spiral of populism. And if you want to look at what that looks like, look at Latin American countries. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to... No, I want to just say the, the one, <laughs> one idea, one idea, right? Poor Which ruler. Is, She's we, never had so much trouble in her life. I knew I'd had to, to do very little tonight. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> One idea analogous to public to, to national service uh, is to, we need, we, what we're really good at in Britain, and you commend it, is the BBC, is public agencies for doing things that the public can trust. And I think we need a lot more public agencies to to, to do things because public agencies are probably less innovative. We can have sacrificed a bit of innovation now in order for something that people trust. And so I would like to see a lot of public agencies and to close, KFW is a brilliant agency which, which redeveloped poor places in Germany. We don't have a KFW. We have things that parade as if they're the same and they're pitiful, pitifully useless. It, it, just speaking of innovation, I wanted to end with one question from our uh, online audience. What is the impact of recent and ongoing technological change on democracy and capitalism? 
is it not a major driver of this dangerous concentration of power and wealth? And it's something that you, you do address in the book, Martin. Well, the answer is that in multiple dimensions, the, and I've already discussed a few of them, um, technology has, as it always has, transformed economic, social, and political life. Uh, I think there's nothing one could do about it. The con modern set of technologies have quite a number of, from this point of view, there's nothing you could do about it. They are what they are, but they are very problematic. Um, they're extremely divisive in terms of who gains the income that they generate. Um, they're very, very small businesses in terms of who, of how many people they employ. They only employ a very limited subset of the society. So that's where all the rent goes to these people. Uh, uh, I'm constantly amused about by Indians who, who believe somehow that the tech sector will somehow solve the employment problem of India. I promise you it won't happen. Uh, the... Uh, they are almost impossible to regulate because of their complexity features. They have utterly transformed the communications and media life of our societies in ways we neither control nor understand. Uh, and they constantly create new things uh, that we'll, we also don't understand and that will make all these problems even worse. They have devastated, uh, they are going to end up we are going to end up in a society where there are no people in factories um, uh, and the uh, concentration of power they give to a few monopolies because they really generate natural monopolies because they have massive network effects and marginal costs are zero. This is new. So uh, my view now is if we don't generate, it may be impossible, the Chinese are the only people trying, and that's not the model. Uh, if we don't generate some set of agencies, whatever it is, some set of regulatory structures that bring what the, some of the implications of what they're doing under um, social, make them socially accountable, we are going, I think, to be in terrible trouble. I just discussed this in passing because, and I, there's some wonderful literature in this area, marvelous, and I've read a lot of it but I don't think anybody has the solution, but my God, it's a challenge. Can I end with a nice cheerful note? It's yes. a suggestion to do with uh, chat GT GPT, right? Um, uh, I've got teenagers, and so I know all about this. Uh, teenagers can now get their essays done by AI, right? Um, so um, ask, ask it the sort of question that my teenagers get in their history, like, um, what caused the First World War, or who, what, 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 why, did, why did Britain go to, to go to war with Germany in the Second World War? Right? Try that question, right? Because that's that's the practical essays that my children have to write uh, each evening, and at last they don't have to do it. They don't have to write anything, and they can just get 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 something written for them. It's devastating. It's chilling what's written because the only source. The only source that's used by chat, by chat GTP is social media. And social media, its sources are whatever paranoid delusions are going around on the internet tonight, right? And so it literally, it will give you completely fake answers to mm. very serious, sensible questions. It's, it's, building a teenage population that will be spectacularly pig ignorant. I, and that's I, done I hate, I by hate, a private company. I hate to contradict you, Paul, but actually it's not. It's not. I have asked many questions. It's actually a really, I mean, it's scary because it can answer the questions. No, it, it, if you ask it, it, it right... It won't, uh, it, won't it won't give you the wrong answer. No, What's you, scary about it is that it will give you the right answer. No, if you ask it to write a poem like Yeats, it will do a fantastically good job. If you ask it a factual point of history, it will produce complete and utter crap. 
Now, I really wish we were here for two hours because I'm really enjoying this. Uh, however, and I know other people have questions, but I have one answer, which is read the book. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.